All right, wonderful. Well, with that, uh, I'm so happy to introduce tonight's speaker. So hello, everyone in person. Hello, everyone um, on Zoom. And I'm just really thrilled to welcome two really um, special, uh, well-known and well-loved uh, botanists in our community who are joining us tonight, Lauren Brown and Ted Elliman. So it's my great privilege to introduce them both. Uh, Lauren Brown has taught plant identification courses for organizations and institutions, including Wesleyan University, the New York Botanical Garden, and the Native Plant Trust. And she's worked in land conservation, both um, professionally and as a dedicated volunteer. She's the author of Weeds and Wildflowers in Winter, a classic, a favorite, formerly Weeds in Winter, as well as Grasses, Sedges, Rushes, and Identification Guide, another favorite, um, and has written nature and botanical articles for various publications. So welcome, Lauren. And um, for many years, Ted Elliman has worked as a botanist and invasive species management coordinator for the Native Plant Trust. Before that, he worked as a contract excuse me, contract ecologist for the federal and state environmental agencies, um, oh, sorry, and the National Park Service. Ted is the author of Wildflowers of New England, which we all treasure. Um, and now with Lauren Brown is the co-author of Grasses, Sedges and Rushes, an Identification Guide, which is the topic of tonight's lecture. Now Ted, semi-retired, continues to teach botany and ecology classes for the Native Plant Trust and other conservation organizations and botanical gardens in New England. So thank you both for being here tonight. Welcome. And we're just so excited to hear your talk. Come on up. Thank you, Melissa, for the introduction. I'm honored to be here, and I really do appreciate the invitation. Make sure, let me first make sure that I can get everything right here. And again, we want to get rid of this annoying thing. It doesn't want to go away, does it? Hmm. Well, we got rid of it before. There we go. Okay, good. Um, yes, well, as I said, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, some of you may or may not know that this book is a revised edition. And can you all hear me, by the way? Okay. It's a revised edition of a book that I wrote in 1979. And tonight, first, I'm going to talk about the original edition, how that came to be. Then Ted will talk about the revised edition, the changes between the two. Then we'll go on a little field trip, and I'm going to show you some pictures of grasses. Ted will show you some pictures of grasses, of, excuse me, sedges and rushes. So that's the format for tonight. Speak up a little bit. Okay, I'll try. I guess I'm, I'm not supposed to move this lectern. Um, the, the focus of the original book was on the grasses, the grass family, the Poaceae. And people often ask me, how did you get interested in the grasses? And the answer is pretty simple. It had nothing to do with the fact that it's one of the largest families of flowering plants in the world. Nothing to do with the fact that grasslands cover huge areas of the earth, and nothing to do with the fact that the grasses stand between us and starvation. I just thought they were beautiful, and I still do. That was fine. I knew they must have names. I wasn't really quite sure how to go about finding out the names. They were sort of in a mysterious cloud. But there was a pivotal moment in 1973. I was in the master's program at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, on a botany trip, field trip, with a legendary professor. I see someone in the audience who will know who that professor was, a legendary professor. And we passed a grass and I said, what's this? And he said, oh, it's just a grass. And he kept on walking. And that got me so annoyed. I think that was, you know, where, where did that come from? Hmm. Okay, um, that got me so annoyed. I think that was the moment when I realized I really had to do something about learning the grasses. However, they're not easy. And let me say now too, if you don't mind, I know there are a lot of experts here in this audience, but I was also told that there could be some beginners. And some of what I'm going to say for a lot of you will be very basic, but if there are beginners in the audience, I just wanna make sure that everybody is on board. So anyway, the grasses are not easy. Identification is based more or less on the flowers. Um, let me try to get the pointer going, sorry. It's, <laughs> We are having technical issues tonight. Pointer options. 
uh, anyway, more or less on the flowers. You can see in the second slide from the left, little fuzzy things sticking out between those scales. Those are the actual flowers. They're microscopic. You don't need to look at those. But what you do need to look at, what you do need to look at is these structures, these scaly structures made up of separate structures. And the flowers are enclosed inside those scales. And these might look big on the screen, but in reality, they'd be measured in millimeters. And if you start trying to identify some grasses, you would have to look at these little scales. You'd have to measure them. Is it one millimeter or 1.5 millimeters? Are there veins on the scales? Do they go all the way to the top or do they start at the bottom and peter out part way up? The point of this is you need magnification. You need a, a good hand lens and at least a, a dissecting scope. So that's an obstacle for a lot of people. And then you might have thought those are strange looking flowers and indeed they are, they're very specialized and that has given rise to a specialized vocabulary. Um, so the first time you start trying to identify grasses, these are the terms you'll come across, glooms, paleas, rachillas, lemmas, spikelets, and they're not impossible to learn. But again, these do stop a lot of people dead in their tracks. So at the time when I started wanting to learn the grasses, these were the sources. You can see they're big, heavy tomes, full of fine print, some illustrations, but you know, not, well, not warm and fuzzy, let's put it that way, a little intimidating. But I was lucky. Some fellow members of the Connecticut Botanical Society connected me with a senior member of the group who knew the grasses, and he was very generous. He spent a lot of time with me. He taught me the terminology. He taught me how to use the keys, and he set me on my way. I was very lucky. Um, I'd also like to tell you a little story about my father. He was a very intelligent man, very learned, but not in botany. And one day he was working on his property, which had some areas of native vegetation. And he came up to me and he said, I just saw 10 different kinds of grasses in the last hour. What are they? He had no hand lens, no microscope. He had never heard of glooms, lemmas, or paleas, but he could see differences. And if you look at these two, I think you can see how even to the untutored eye, these two are quite different. All you need to do is look at the shapes. The one on the left is a pyramid, triangle. The one on the right is a cylinder. So it dawned on me that the differences among many grass species could be seen with the naked eye and articulated in plain English. And I was very excited about my discoveries. I was enjoying learning the grasses. And I just wanted to share my discoveries with the world. I already had one book published, Weeds in Winter. This is a guide to identifying dried herbaceous plants in winter. On the left is the original hardcover edition. On the right is a reissue, which is the, a different title, same content. But that gave me the courage to try for a second. And in 1979, Houghton Mifflin came out with this book, Grasses, an Identification Guide. On the left is the hardcover. On the right is the paperback that came out soon thereafter. So how did I go about trying to simplify the identification of these plants? How did I go about trying to make it more approachable? For a minute, I just want to talk about various methods of plant of identification, various ways that people go about identifying plants. There's a time-honored method that I call flip and jab. If your book has illustrations, you flip through the pages until you find one that looks good. You point your finger at it. You say, that's it. It can work. It's inefficient. It can work, but it's inefficient. Then there are several variations or, or several intermediate, well, excuse me, um, at the opposite end of that spectrum is the dichotomous key, which most of us are used to, which in theory is highly efficient, highly logical, the forking choices, 1A, 1B, 2A, 1B, et cetera. Um, they should be marvelous, but a lot of people, for one reason or another, just find dichotomous keys difficult to work with. So. Various authors have come up with various variations. Um, this is Lisa Stanley's excellent field guide to the Carex, the genus Carex in New England. She has a, a matrix key based on several different traits of the, of the different plants. And then Jerry Jenkins, this is a new book of his, came out a couple of years ago. Um, he has what I might call a grouping key. He sorts the grasses into many different groups. There's one page per group. And 
at this point, it becomes a little bit of a flip and jab. You just turn the pages until you find a group that looks good to you. And then there are several species in that group and you flip and jab again. So yes, it's flip and jab, but you have way fewer choices. I wrote a dichotomous key for the weeds in winter book, and I found it wasn't as easy to write as I thought it would be. So for the grasses book, I did what I call a, a grouping key, which again leads to flip and jab. So here's the identification guide. That's what I called it. I want to call attention to the glossary on the left-hand page. I desperately wanted to keep it simple. So you see there are only three terms that people needed to learn to use the glossary. There's At the top is inflorescence, self-explanatory, the assemblage of flowers. Then the flower cluster. I do want to talk about that because when I showed you that picture earlier of all those structures with the scales, um, the technical term, I'm sure all of you know that is the spikelet, but I didn't want to use that term. So I called it a flower cluster because that's really what it is. It's a cluster of flowers. And those clusters, as you saw, are made up of scales, which enclose the flowers. The technical terms, there are three different kinds of scales. You know, the glooms at the bottom, then the lemmas and the paleas facing the lemmas. Um, but I didn't want to introduce those terms either. And so I just called them scales, which they are, flower scales. And for the level of detail of this book, it wasn't necessary to differentiate among the, the three different kinds of scales. So I just called them flower scales. And then at the bottom are, is a, are brass, which is pretty self-evident as well. So here's the identification guide on the right. There are five groups. You're probably looking at this page and saying you only see four. That's because the designer, for some reason, put the fifth choice on the following page. But there are five groups with illustrations to help people. So you just go through the five groups and choose one that looks like a good match with your specimen. And for sake of illustration, I'm going to go with the, the third one down. If your plant has a round stem with flower branches forking from one point at the top, go to page 26. So we go to page 26, you find that section, it's in the middle of the page, plants with a round stem and flower branches forking from one point at the top. And then again, there are three more groups, the ones in bold face. I'm not gonna read them here. A little bit of flip and jab, you just go through one and decide which one is best. I'm gonna use the top one. Flowers are lined continuously along the branches with no space between them. And then there's a list of the species that fit into that category. And here again, flip and jab, you flip through the pages till you find your best match. And hopefully you have the sense to look at all of them and make sure there's not a better one, one page farther along. This is a sample page. I prepared black and white line drawings for each species. And you see the letters with the little arrows pointing to the salient characteristics of the plant. Those little arrows might seem obvious, but actually they were first used by Roger Torrey Peterson in his 1934 Field Guide to the Birds. They were, and they were revolutionary at that point. And he even wrote about them in the introduction, the Peterson Guide. And he was so invested in them, I worried that maybe he had trademarked them, copyrighted them. So I wrote him and asked if I could use them. And he said, yes, and that was very gracious. But anyway, the letters point to the salient characters and then you go down and match up the, the letters where I describe briefly describe the salient characteristic tooth jagged flower clusters flower branch looks like a closed zipper then there's the note I put in the note grows in tufts a note about the habit and then below are the attributes that any identification guide would have for any plant size which is very helpful for the reader we all know some grasses are big some are small habitat obviously they grow in different habitats Alien, that's the status, which is not relevant to identification, and we did not use that term in the revised edition. Um, annual or perennial, again, that's the habit. You know, are they annual, perennial? Are they sprawling, upright, spreading by rhizomes, and so on? And the flowering season, because grasses are seasonal, just like all flowering plants. If you hadn't seen the name of the plant there, when you first saw the picture, you might have thought it was crabgrass because it has a similar inflorescence with the branches forking at the top. And they grow in similar habitats, really crummy soil, and they both appear in the late summer. So I figured a lot of people might get it confused with crabgrass. And I put in a section at the bottom, easily confused. 
So where that's appropriate, where there were one or two or three species that could be confused, I had little notes about how to tell them apart. We all know there are two families, the members of which look a lot like the grasses. Those are the sedges and the rushes, sedge on the left, rush on the right. Northern long sedge on the left, what is now called salt marsh rush on, rush on the right. It's a more appropriate name for it. But for many years, decades, for all I know, centuries, it was called black grass, but it's not a grass. And this goes to show the confusion that I think a lot of people have had for a long time among these three families. There are sedges that are called bulrush, although they're not rushes. There's a grass, Andropogon virginicus, which is called broom sedge. It's not a sedge. So I figured I really couldn't expect the readers to know the differences among the three families. I had visions of someone coming in with a sedge from the field, trying to identify it, excuse me, getting frustrated. Um, so I included several sedges and rushes and set it up so that people didn't even know, need to know the difference among the three families. They're all intermingled according to other traits. I also included a few plants that, again, a layperson might confuse for a grass. You know, long, narrow leaves, drab flowers. These are just two examples, cattails and burr reed. I really wanted to make it easy. This was a feature I put in the back, grouping the plants by habitat. So here's one example in the middle of the page, salt marshes and their edges. So if you're standing on the edge of a salt marsh, and you know not many species grow in salt marshes. You're too lazy even to use a simple key. So you just go through that list and again, turn the pages until you find something that looks like a good match. Excuse me. Um, I had a similar, a similar section for flowering times. And here at the bottom is early spring flowering, which believe it or not, we are in now. And just an example here. So it's April 5th. You're in the woods and you see some beautiful grass-like green shoots coming up out of the ground and the stalk in the middle with a little purple black spike on the top. And you look through those choices and sure enough, it's Carex pensylvanica, which where I live now is in flower. So that's how the book was set up. Clear naked eye characteristics, plain English. That was all well and good, but nothing in life is perfect. And this book is no exception. And I knew that sooner or later, people would find species that weren't in the book. Again, I didn't want someone to come in, get frustrated, get annoyed, maybe throw the book away. So in the, in the end, and here's that little toolbar came back again. It does not want to go away. Anyway, in the end, I had a section called, If You Do Not Find Something in This Book. And there, I explained that the reader might well find something that isn't in the book. And they would have to go to the technical sources. Remember, this was 1979, and this was it. There was no internet. These were the sources. And as I said before, they are intimidating. It's, it's, it's a real leap from a book like this, like mine, to use these sources. Not, it's not a gradual transition. Um, so I had a sort of a tutorial in the back. Illustrations, illustrating the, the different technological technical terms, there was also a text glossary, and I included references and guidance on how to use the technical books. So that was the original as it came out in 1979. It stood the test of time. The books kept selling over the decades because the grasses weren't changing. What was changing, however, was the world of publishing, and specifically, color printing was becoming more economically feasible. And it seemed as if every time I turned around, I saw a new nature guide coming out with full color pictures. And a little voice started nagging in the back of my head, should this book have color? I resisted the idea for a long time for reasons which I'm sure a lot of you can appreciate because a lot of people prefer black and white line drawings. In very subtle ways, a line drawing can accentuate the important characteristics and filter out the unimportant. But still, I could see that the tide was turning. People were expecting color. And especially with the internet, you turn on your computer and you have full color in front of you whenever you want. So eventually I came around and I began to see that it was time for the book to have a fresh face and appeal to a new generation. 
I was lucky to find Ted as a co-author. I was lucky to find the Yale University Press as a publisher. And in 2020, out came our new edition, Grasses, Sedges, Rushes. And I will now turn it over to Ted, who will tell you about the differences between the new and the original. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, and thank you, uh, Melissa, for your very kind uh, introduction. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, boy. It's <laughs> a great start. Um, not mouse. sure what to do here. What up there? You can do the, this, uh -oh. the mouse here or the down arrow. Oh, yeah. OK. Um, so I just want to say about uh, collaborating with Lauren, it's just been a great pleasure and privilege to work with Lauren uh, on this new edition, uh, as it did for many people. Uh, Lauren's book got me motivated and started with identifying grasses, sedges, and rushes. And we've heard a lot of other people have that same reaction. Um, and I was delighted and honored when Lauren asked me to collaborate with her on this new edition. Uh, in these next slides, I will focus on the changes uh, that we made for this edition, especially on the changes in the species description pages. So here, uh, just <clears throat> on this slide, summarizing, I'll summarize what some of these changes are. Uh, we have photographs now, color photographs for every species in the book. Uh, we've redesigned the species pages and we've revised many of the species descriptions. Uh, we've updated scientific names, uh, added common names where in some cases there weren't any uh, common names, say for some sedges and even some grasses back in 1979. Uh, we added just a few species. I'll explain that a little bit uh, in a, a little bit later. Um, and Lauren mentioned um, just uh, comparing similar looking species in the text. Uh, we did more of that for the new edition so people could uh, more easily compare uh, lookalike species. Uh, we added a brief section on rare and invasive species, explaining what those terms mean uh, officially. Um, and also uh, giving examples of some rare and invasive species that are in the book. And we also, finally, we updated references, of course. So uh, Lauren uh, showed the, uh, uh, those uh, old references. We still use them, to be sure. Uh, but there are many new references as well. And they're included in the, uh, in the reference list um, that we have at the end of the book. Um, with all that said, I think the challenge that we had and, and uh, how we were really perceiving this edition was that while we were making all these revisions, we really wanted, and I certainly very much wanted, to maintain the qualities of the original book uh, because they were so special. I mean, to me as a user at the time, simplicity, ease of use, attractiveness, compact size, and just very direct uh, kind of explanation of these uh, uh, grasses, sedges, and rushes. So just looking at the book and the breakdown of species, uh, it's primarily about grasses. Um, grasses are two thirds of the species in the book, uh, but we do have nearly a quarter of the book uh, comprised of sedges. There's 33 species of sedges. Uh, then a handful of rush species, uh, seven species altogether. And as Lauren mentioned, uh, uh, there are a few kind of gen sort of lookalike um, uh, grass-like species as well that are not in these three families. So that is the breakdown that we have. So I will show, uh, to show the revisions that we made and what they look like, um, I'm going to just do so with a couple of sedges here and also uh, two species of grass to show the revised pages. So first of all, uh, looking at Carex scoparia or pointed broom sedge, uh, <clears throat> the page on the left is, of course, from the original. And then the page on the right is the revised edition. So what are the changes there? Um, I would just say, first off, we kept all of Lauren's line drawings. So they are all still in the book. We thought it just really important to, to keep those because they're so important for identification. Uh, we added the photograph, of course, and what we were aiming to do there was to have the photograph work with, not fight against, the line drawings so that they would reinforce each other's strengths 
as um, uh, for identification. Um, as you see too, we kind of redesigned the the, uh, the page a bit, and um, we also added some taxonomic and natural history information, so somewhat of a fuller explanation uh, for the um, for the species as a whole. So that's one example of uh, changes that we've made in this revision. Uh, <clears throat> going on to another sedge, uh, so this is Carex vulpinoidea, or common fox sedge. Uh, again, the <clears throat> original on the left, and then on the right, uh, showing um, just the changes that we made. Again, the photograph, uh, keeping all the line drawings, and um, also adding paragraphs below, which I've highlighted. Should say I, those highlights aren't in the book. They're, I'm just uh, showing them. I highlighted them for this presentation. Uh, but the first paragraph in blue says, could be confused with Carex Depeta, which is on the following page, so people could easily um, uh, go to that page to look at a similar sed similar looking sedge uh, and make a determination. Uh, and we've uh, added below also, um, uh, we've added also some species that are not in the book. So the example here is Carex anectans which looks like Carex vulpinoidea. We've added some species that are not in the book, where, which are also similar, uh, where we explain textually in the text what the distinctions are between them. Uh, but I, I'll just say here, we were lucky to find a, in this case, a photograph that shows both anectins and vulpinoidea. So that's below there on the right, below on the right. Uh, then <clears throat> uh, we're the third species. Uh, this is a dicanthelium acuminatum. Uh, the, I'm only showing the revised uh, uh, page here. Um, <clears throat> in the original uh, book, it wasn't dicanthelium. It was in 1979. It was panicum, so it was a different genus, a different name altogether. Uh, so we've made all those changes and kept the, uh, the synonym, the old name there, uh, underneath the, uh, the current name. Uh, added a couple of photographs and um, just, again, a bit more information than was in the uh, original version. Uh, also, too, on the left, we have discussed some of the distinctions between dicanthelium and panicum. Uh, we do have some panicum species in the book as well, and just talking about uh, the fact that they have been split out and what those distinctions are. And then finally, very familiar grass. Um, everybody knows the invasive uh, common reed or Phragmites australis. And uh, in this case right here, in the original, it's a one page, uh, just description, just basically a description. Uh, and again, the photograph, and um, we've added all the, everything on the right-hand side, uh, talking about its invasiveness, its ecology, its impacts, and also the differentiation between this non-native species that's so invasive and the native, quite rare on the landscape, the native Phragmites. So much of this information not known at the time of the original book, and uh, we've added this uh, in our pages uh, to this revised edition. <clears throat> we've also added a short section, as I mentioned, on rare and invasive species. And I'm just showing uh, a couple of uh, examples right there. Um, one of which uh, we basically explain what these terms mean. I mean, how is a plant determined to be rare? How is a plant classified as invasive? What sort of goes into that and who determines it? So uh, that's part of the explanation here. And then we give uh, certain examples of each <clears throat> from the book. Um, and one of them is Carex swanii, uh, which actually is a new one, one of those we added. And it's extremely common sedge around here in the woods. You see it all over the place. Um, but in the range that the book covers, and it covers a broad area out to Wisconsin and Minnesota, uh, to the west, Iowa, and so forth, uh, in Wisconsin, it's listed as an extremely rare species. So just parts of the range where that one. Um, and there are a couple of others, too, that are common in parts of the range, uh, but very rare in others. And uh, we do the same, we just saw Phragmites. Uh, so we talk about some invasive species, one of which is, of course, Japanese stillgrass. We added that too. Um, and that was one all over the landscape now, not even documented in New England in 1979. So very rapid spread. Anyway, 
uh, we explain and give examples of those. And then um, <clears throat> finally, and uh, before uh, turning it back to Lauren to talk about more, uh, talk about grasses, I'll just mention, and we both mentioned, uh, the number of uh, new books about grasses, sedges, and rushes, and just general floras that have come out uh, since the time of the original. And in the case, just, uh, I know many people here in the room are familiar with many of these books. Um, all of these books, except for one, have actually come out since 2011. So, uh, you know, the ones that you see, um, the only one that's older is the Gleason and Cronquist, the second from the right at the bottom, but all these wonderful new books and um, which uh, we have both benefited from and really appreciate um, and webs you know, websites like Go Botany and uh, there are a number of others as well. They're excellent for, for plant identification. So in light, of, in light of this, I mean, what is the a kind of enduring value? What did we see as the value of our book? These are comprehensive uh, books covering hundreds of species, necessarily in many cases using uh, <clears throat> uh, specialized botanical vocabulary. And so we see the value of our book uh, pretty much now as it was then um, uh, in terms of its accessibility to the general user who's just becoming familiar with these plants, practicality, and the focus on readily observable features uh, just uh, um, uh, with uh, commonly encountered species in the general landscape. So that's kind of the value that uh, and the quality that we were uh, uh, trying to maintain and perpetuate in uh, creating this new edition. Thank you, Tim. Okay, well, we'll start our little field trip. Um, I, In my part, I have two goals. First, I want to illustrate some of the naked eye characteristics that we use to differentiate various species. And second, if there are beginners here in the crowd, I'm going to be showing four species which are very common. They're all spring flowering species. species. Spring is coming. And if you get a handle on these four species that I'm showing, it will give you a good springboard for identifying more species as the season goes on. So those are the, the two goals of this part of the presentation. I have You saw this slide before. I'm showing it now because I want to explain the main part of the plant that we have people focus on is the inflorescence that we have people focus on. Um, I wish the pointer system were working better, but anyway, that's, that's what it is. Um, the assemblage of the flowers not the little spikelets that are, that are at the end of those branches or that are crawling up the, the tall one, but the inflorescence. And I think someone, even with minimal botanical education, maybe no botanical education, can see and articulate differences between these two species. So the one on the left, the Poa pretensis, the inflorescence is a pyramid, as we mentioned before, the, the Phleum pretensi, the Timothy, um, is a, a cylinder. Also, the Poa pretensis has a lot of branches, and the Timothy has no branches. The, the one with the branches, the, the botanical term is panicle. The other one is a spike. We don't use those terms in the book, but I'm going to use them here in the talk. And a lot of grasses have their flowers born in panicles. A lot of grasses have their flowers born in spikes. We can't just use that character. So I'm going to show you ones now I'm going to show you four species that have flowers and panicles, and again, show you the naked eye characters that we use to differentiate those. Here, you can again, you can see some obvious differences. Here's Boa pretensis, Kentucky bluegrass, Bromus tectorum, downy brome, sheet grass. The, the Kentucky bluegrass has an upright inflorescence. The downy brome has a drooping inflorescence. Also, the downy brome has the bristles. <coughs> Excuse me. Downy brome has the bristles. Excuse me, one minute. Um, I also want to go back to those four attributes that we mentioned before, size, habitat, habit, season. Size can be helpful in this case. 
Kentucky bluegrass is usually, in my experience, two to three feet high. Downy brome, maybe a foot high. Habitat, you could see them growing both along a roadside and say it's the same habitat, but the downy brome is more likely to be in the really crummy, gravelly soil right on the shoulder. And the Kentucky bluegrass more likely to be back where there's actual soil. Season won't help you because these are both spring grasses. But habit, as I mentioned before, is also helpful with the upright inflorescence and the drooping inflorescence. Poa pretensis, again, Shedonorus pretensis. I understand that the accepted name for the Shedonorus is actually Lolium perenni, which it might have been even when we wrote the book. But some sources, most notably Arthur Haynes, no Flora Nova Angliae, we're still using Shedonorus pretensis. So that's what we went with. And that's what I'm going to use in the course of the talk, if nobody minds. Um, these two are not so dramatically different as the two species that I showed you before. Um, they both have upright inflorescences. <clears throat> there are no bristles on either of them. They both grow in similar habitats. Indeed, you can find them both growing next to each other, intermingled. Um, they're about the same size. They both flower in the spring. So how do we differentiate them? <laughs> I want to say a word first about, gra about leaves in the grass family. Again, a lot of you, I'm sure, know this. But with very few exceptions, Leaves, all leaves in the grass family are all simple. They're not compound. They're entire. They're not toothed. They're alternate. They're not opposite. Um, they're long and narrow, and they have parallel veins. So generally, leaves would be the last part of a plant I would have somebody look at to tell one species from another. But in this case, they can be helpful. And with the poa pretensis, the, the picture on the left, um, again, pointers aren't working very well here. But I hope you can see the tip of the leaf looks like the prow of a canoe. And this is something that people can see with the naked eye. It's called the boat-shaped leaf tip. And it's characteristic of all species of poa. Shedonorus does not have the boat-shaped leaf tip. So there's a pretty visible, clear difference. What Shedonorus does have, if you look at the yellow picture in the middle, that's the blade coming down. And where it joins the sheath, you see those little protrusions coming out on each side. Those are called oracles. And poa pretensis does not have those oracles. So in this case, we use the leaves to help people distinguish these two species. Looking at the flowers, what I really want to show here is the picture with the black background on the right. That's a single flower, a single flower scale from the poa pretensis, gone to seed now, now that it's tan. And at the base, you see those little sticky, curly hairs. No, they're referred to as cobwebby hairs, which is a perfect description. Those are characteristic only of the genus Poa, in this region at least. You won't find them in any other species, though not all species of Poa have them. But the Shedonorus does not have the cobwebby hairs. If you were to take out one of those scales, one of those clusters, you would not find the cobwebby hairs. So there's another naked eye difference that people can see that can be articulated in plain English. I've thrown a third one into the mix here, bromus enormus, smooth brome. So here we have three grasses, all with the inflorescences born in panicles. They're all about the same size. They all grow in the same habitat, fields, meadows, and roadsides. They all flower in the spring. They're all upright. They're all perennial. So again, how do you distinguish these without, you know, as I said, counting the veins on the, on the scales, which in some cases you would have to do? Again, I think even someone with minimal training can see that the flower clusters on the Bromus enormus are much longer and more narrow and more pointed than those on the other two species. You can see it here in the illustrations. These are from the book. And see it here close up much longer, more narrow, more pointed. And then we go back to the poa pretensis, the cobwebby hairs. The bromus enormus does not have the cobwebby hairs. We can go back to Shedonorus with the oracles where the blade joins the sheath. Bromus enormus does not have those oracles. We can go back to poa pretensis with the boat-shaped leaf tip. Bromus enormus does not have the boat-shaped leaf tip. And all these differences, 
subtle though they might seem, are all addressed in the sections I mentioned before, could be confused with. Because otherwise, you know, if you were just flipping through, looking at the pages, even reading the descriptions, you might still be shrugging your shoulders. So I really tried to accentuate the salient characters. So that's just a brief description of how we approach the grasses. And I will now turn it back to Ted, who will talk about sedges and rushes. Okay, uh, so I'll uh, be talking primarily about sedges and rushes. Uh, so this first um, uh, slide here is a chart that uh, Lauren actually made. It's not in the book, uh, but it does uh, have the three families here. And it uh, talks about distinct distinctions between the three um, at, at you know, various parts of, uh, uh, for example, there's stems, the flowers, the inflorescence, fruit, and so forth. Um, I'll just uh, take a look at the stems here because they're the most morphologically evident uh, uh, <clears throat> part of the plant, uh, just naked eye part. So it says that the grass family here, usually round, hollow, except at the nodes. Sedge family, solid, usually triangular, and the rush family, solid and round. So just a, sort of a general sketch of distinctions between the three families. Of course, there's that ditty that I think probably everybody in the room has heard. And, uh, you know, I think many you know, have used it from time to time. But anyway, sedges have edges, rushes are round. And then the next line has a lot of variations. The one I learned, I mean, it dates me too. Grasses are jointed from the top to the ground. Um, but is this always true? Um, now, uh, just thinking in terms of the sedges and rushes, not all sedges have triangular stems. And certainly not all rushes have uh, necessarily solid stems. So when using the key in this book, um, as Lauren has devised it, um, don't necessarily go by these old precepts. Just look at the plant itself and its characteristics, uh, because the key does not separate necessarily uh, the groups according to uh, these patterns that you uh, see here, these general patterns. And I'll just mention briefly, Lauren did mention um, the characteristics of the grass flower, the poaceae on the top, and just saying that the, the flower, the, the reproductive part of the flower is in, uh, enfolded by two scales, the lemma and palea, um, and with glooms also underneath. And just looking at the difference in the flower structure with the, with the sedge on the lower left, uh, with a single scale called a bract here, so different from the uh, grass flower in that respect, only having a single scale. And then with a the rush uh, family being very different in appearance, um, again, all these flowers are small, uh, but looking at what appear to be actually six scales are indeed the petals and sepals, uh, collectively called tepals, that surround the capsule, that surround the uh, the reproductive part that turns in a multi-seated capsule. So differences, those distinctions between the three and the flower. So with the sedges in the in the book, uh, we covered 11 genera. So there are 11 genera that are presented and they're listed on the left here. And um, the photos uh, on this um, slide are all from the book. Um, and one species shown here for each of those, uh, each genus uh, that's represented right there on the left. So a lot of different forms, um, a lot of variety, a lot of diversity, even the species numbers are, are fairly limited in the book, um, just showing a great variety of forms in the sedge family. So Lauren did mention her illustrated glossary at the beginning, um, and I would just uh, like to reinforce that a little bit. I mean, the illustrated glossary for grasses, sedges, and rushes. In this case, I'm showing it for the sedges. Uh, but uh, certainly when I was using the book and as a beginner with all this, uh, these terms here, as Lauren said, are not really necessary for following the key and identifying a plant, but I always found them very helpful. Gave me a familiarity with the plant that uh, I think gave me a certain confidence. So um, I think these illustrated uh, uh, glossaries are, are very important. So now I'm going on to the key itself. And uh, Lauren in her 
introductory part did show um, keying with the with plants with a round stem. I'm jumping to where you have plants with a triangular stem. So I and the highlight again is mine. That's not in the book, uh, but that is all of the <clears throat> uh, left page there, and it's. Uh, the upper part of the page on the right follows more plants with a triangular stem before it goes on with plants with a round stem. And these are all sedges. Um, there are sedges with round stems, but they're not obviously included with these plants with a triangular stem. So, <clears throat> so the first, um, I obviously can't uh, give every example here. So I'll give a few examples following the key. And what I've highlighted here with the triangular stem plants are flowers, those with flowers and flattened clusters and with a feather-like arrangement and that little drawing uh, that uh, helps to uh, just guide you to it. So here we have, um, th this brings you to the flat sedges, the Cyperus, and I think there are four species altogether in the book. And I'm just uh, uh, showing here two of them and two that look very, very much alike as you can see by the line drawings and by the, um, by the photographs too, not much to distinguish these two, Cyperus strigosus on the left, Cyperus esculinus on the right. But just looking at the text, uh, reading the text, the descriptions, it does bring some things to light. Um, for example, on the right, it talks about the Cyperus esculinus having hard little tubers uh, on the rhizomes and it uh, shows that illustration. It mentions also that the Cyperus strigosus has a swollen base, no tubers, but swollen base um, that the Esculenus does not have. And also uh, uh, <coughs> uh, mentioning that the inflorescence itself, the collection of flower spikes, flower clusters, tends to be more congested on the strigosus than on the Esculenus in those illustrations, uh, uh, indicating that as well. So going on to a couple of uh, more sedges uh, presented in the book, and this is uh, another part of the key. So uh, going down to the bottom there, and we'll be looking at a couple of Balbachina species, uh, those no side branches in the stem, but many in the inflorescence and with long leafy bracts. And looking at the two species of Balbachina um, <clears throat> uh, that are in the book and uh, plants that could be confused uh, quite easily. Uh, but here were the illustrations, looking at the differences between the two, where on the left with the robustus, those flower clusters are held very tightly uh, on the stem with very short stalked or sessile and all in a uh, congested bunch. And whereas with the uh, river bulrush on the right, uh, they radiate out on stalks. So the flower clusters are radiating out um, uh, further distinction just in the bracts, the leafy bracts, uh, with the Balbachinus robustus kind of elevated, pointed upwards, uh, spreading outwards, whereas with the river bulrush long and drooping down. So differences in the appearance of the bracts and also the habitats are generally different. So uh, brackish or salt conditions for the robustus and versus freshwater. Uh, marshes and lake shores and lake shallow, lake and pond shallows for the Balbachinus fluviatilis and all this uh, discussed on these pages. So going to one more group, and this is the largest group. These are the triangular stem plants with flowers or flower clusters lined vertically along the stem. And these are the carex, um, of which we have 15, I think 14 or 15 species in the book. Uh, so the uh, page on the on the left, the genus Carex, uh, again from the book discussing some of the features of the Carex, things that distinguish it from other sedges, and just some uh, uh, just general comments about the variety and the number of actual species within this genus. So the photographs all from the book here just showing the variety. So you can actually see again just very directly without necessary magnification, um, just how different. Uh, many of these species look. So on those six photographs there. And <clears throat> showing uh, images of uh, some of the sedges that we have in the book, uh, two that look very different, they are on adjacent pages, but two that are very different are the Carex laxiflora and the Carex goparia. 
And so looking at the differences in the uh, inflorescence, the male and the separate male and female spikes, of course, with the lacks of flora and much leafier appearance and with uh, broad bracts uh, associated with the, uh, with the flowers, with flower clusters uh, for the lacks of flora versus uh, those little egg-shaped heads with a scoparia with the male flowers uh, and the female flowers separate, uh, but on the same head, male flowers below as the uh, line drawing F uh, delineates and is indicated there um, in the ABCD and so forth. Also much more of a naked stem appearing plant. So some are very different, whereas certainly for someone um, uh, not familiar or just becoming familiar with the sedges, there are those that look very much alike. And two we have here that are in the book are Carex intumescens and Carex folliculata. Um, and just the shape of the spikes is similar. Uh, general kind of overall form is, is somewhat similar and they do uh, grow in overlapping habitats. You can find them in the, in the same general area. So again, just uh, talking about the differences between the two, uh, showing the differences between the two, the more remote spikes in the uh, Northern Long uh, Sedge, uh, stalked often the, the lower spikes um, and so on, some other differences, but just, uh, just giving a very direct indication of those uh, distinctions. So going on to the rushes, and uh, we, as mentioned before, we have seven rushes that are covered in the book. Um, all of them are very common. Um, we uh, explain here on the left about the rush family, what distinguishes it, um, and talk about not only Juncus, which is the largest genus of rush, uh, of course, but we also talk about Lusula, the wood rush. We have a single Lusula in the book. So talking about those two and uh, uh, their habitats and different life strategies. And on the right, we show salt marsh rush, uh, which Lauren has mentioned previously, uh, traditionally known as black grass. <clears throat> and um, uh, just looking at the distinctive features of this, kind of a smallish to medium size rush uh, with the flower clusters on top of the stem, uh, kind of a single leaf coming up on the uh, sort of the middle of the stem. And then with the bracts of the inflorescence, uh, you can see those associated with flower clusters, but not sort of overtopping them, being well below the top of the flower clusters. So we are comparing that with path rush. Uh, and this, of course, the very common, very variable, uh, ubiquitous uh, rush that occurs in many kinds of habitats. Uh, but in sort of a general, sort of some ways, it resembles the black grass. Uh, but here, just showing that those bracts uh, much exceed the inflorescence. So giving the distinction there, um, in addition to uh, talking or giving a lot of natural history information about the path rush. And there are several other rushes in the book. And as I mentioned, one of the uh, uh, wood rushes, Lusula. So that sort of uh, come to um, uh, the end here. There are a lot of grasses here. <laughs> Anybody identify any of these grasses? It's a, this is probably in uh, Peru. And so this Royal Road is actually an Inca Royal Road. So this is part of, uh, this is centuries and centuries old Royal Road. I thought it still looked very beautiful. But my point is with, um, anyway, with uh, this Royal Road slide was that um, H.D. Harrington uh, in his book, How to Know Grasses and Grass-like Plants, published in 1977, he wrote that there is no Royal Road to grass, sedge, and rush identification, by which you mean that a lot of work is in your own hands. There are guides here and so forth, but a lot of the, uh, a lot of, uh, you have to do a lot of work, repetition, and, and to um, begin to understand, or really to understand these plants. <clears throat> and um, fully and personally appreciating the many challenges that grasses, sedges, and rushes present for, uh, for identification we have intended this book uh, first to provide the reader with an accessible pathway to recognizing grasses, sedges, and rushes based on general form, 
and observable stem leaf <clears throat> and inflorescence features. Second, to enable the identification of many of the common grasses, sedges, and rushes in the Northeast. And third, to inspire confidence and enthusiasm for continuing explorations into grasses, sedges, and rushes that are such a significant component of our natural landscapes. Thank you. Eagles. So we do have time for some questions, um, both from the in-person audience and from the Zoom chat. So, any questions? And if we can repeat the questions for the Zoom audience. Yes, yes, on. yes. And I'm glad you reminded me. Let's go over here. Yes, um, Lisa. Yes. Which new species did you add to the edition? We added microstegium. The question, sorry, glad you reminded me. And I'm extra glad you reminded me because I can't stand it when I'm in an audience and I can't hear the questions. <laughs> so thank you. Um, Lisa's question is, was which three species did we add to the new edition? We added microstegium viminium, stilt grass, because as Ted said, it's everywhere now, it was nowhere in 1979. And because of the stilt and carex fawnii, which is was not in the original, and because we added the stilt grass, Laersia virginica, white grass, you know, is almost identical to stilt grass. And we felt because people are often out there pulling up the stilt grass, they grow intermingled. Not only are they almost identical, not only do they grow in the same habitat, you can find them intermingled. So we felt it was important for people to know the difference. So those are the three species. Yes. Those are ones you covered in your book. Um, but are, do you have any like mono associations with particular grasses that are interesting or sedges or rushes for that matter? Like uh, insects that feed on them or those plants? Yeah. Um, I'm not 100% sure I heard the whole question. You wanted uh, to know if we have was, association? The question was, um, is there anything in the book with any of the plants in the book about faunal associations with those plants? Here and there, it certainly was not a focus. Um, for a lot of the species in the original and also in the in the revised edition, if I could find interesting information about the species, I included it. In some cases, there were faunal associations, but no, it was, it was not a focus. We have a, a question from the chat. Um, do you have a microscope you would recommend for starting ID? Good question. Maybe maybe someone in the audience, the question was, do you have a microscope that you could recommend for starting ID? Sure. Maybe someone in the audience would like to offer their recommendation. Yes. I found just a small little ruler plane uh, for 20 bucks at uh, Nassau. Okay, the answer was a jeweler's lens, right? For 20 bucks, folds out. folds out. And that was that was enough for you? Well, there you have it. <laughs> yeah. Nice and economical. Yeah. Yes. How is it on, on your eyes? I, I, uh... Well, I just have to calculate. Like, like, the the I, speaker is saying you have to play with it a little bit. Yeah. I, I will just say I, I did have a very inexpensive microscope. And, but I just found as I got older, they started, I, I mean, I really started having uh, visual or vision problems just for using it for a while. So one thing to be aware of. Yeah. No one in the audience wants to make a recommendation? Yes? No? Um, actually, Jerry Jenkins, the book I showed you, Grasses of the Northern Forest Region, he discusses that topic. So you I've been talking to the audience here, even though it's a Zoom question. Um, and it's it's in some of the introductory material. He has a recommendation. Yes. You have a website that will discuss auxiliary uh, information like maps, location, uh, things that may change. Do we have a website with maps, locations, things that may change? That's beyond my capabilities. Uh, or do you recommend one? Just to, to be clear about the question, when you say things that may change like species, 
uh, migration or, or movement in response to climate change or? Yes. Okay, that's the question. Are you recommending, a, asking for a recommendation of a website? Do you have a website? No, <laughs> no. I'm, I'm, I'm a print person. We have one more from the chat um, that wanted to know if either of you are leading any field walks or workshops this summer. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I do need a, uh, a number of uh, field walks for different organizations. The, the organization I've been mainly associated with is Native Plant Trust in, in Framingham, and I'm doing a number of programs for them. Um, and I do some for other organizations too. Uh, Coastal Maine Botanical Garden, <laughs> Coastal Maine. Absolutely. Yeah, and the question was, is either of us is leading walks or field trips? I'm doing a class for Native Plant Trust on June 8th. It's going to be in New Haven, Connecticut. You can find the information on the Native Plant Trust website. I Yes, I'm uh, doing a field trip to, uh, it's near Albany, to Toronto Park in New York State. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Lisa, yes, Lisa is teaching. Yeah, definitely. Lisa is teaching uh, classes on sedges for Native Plant Trust, which I would highly recommend. That's it. Anything else from chat? Yeah. Um, Let's see. Uh, Justin, thanks. Thank you. Okay. And thanks to all of you. Oh, Doug? Okay. I, I've got a question. I just, one of your pages that was up on the screen was the charter, Junk is Tenuous. And I saw it down there and mentioned two growth forms. Can you explain? I don't know. I didn't know that. What I was talking about was when you see it in compacted soil, you know, woodland paths, parking lots, places like that. It's usually very small and scraggly. And then you can see it in the field and it looks completely different and tall and free. Yeah. Can be confusing. Yes, yes, very. Yes. Yep. Okay. Do you want to give your announcement about the book? Uh, yes, we do have copies of the book here if anyone's interested in purchasing uh, $20. And we'll accept cash or a check is, is fine. Um, and we'll autograph, obviously, we'll autograph the book. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have uh, 15 copies there. So, uh, they're for sale now. Uh, for people who are in the Zoom, to make this announcement oh, now. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. Um, uh, people who are here on Zoom or others who may not want to purchase the book here, but uh, May later, uh, that you've attended this lecture, the Yale Press, who published the book, um, is offering a discount to anybody attending this lecture. So uh, <laughs> uh, you can get the book for 30% off the listed price, which is 22%. Um, if you, <laughs> I, I, I have to give you a code number, so I will do that. I'll give you a code number and then a telephone number to call. And you should get um, a 30%. If you want to buy the book, you can get a 30% discount from the publisher. So first of all, I'll give the code, uh, which uh, uh, these are all in caps. I don't know if uh, it's case sensitive or not, but these are all in caps. The uh, letters are uh, B E G S R. O four two four, uh, but just to make sure, uh, where I said B E G S R, that could be a zero. It's hard for me to see, so uh, it could be zero four two four or O four two four. So I'll just say it one more time: B E G S R uh, O or zero four two four. Okay, and the uh, phone number, and this is the uh, distributor of, of Yale Press's books. It's called Triliteral. Um, uh, their telephone number is 1-800-405-1619. That's 1-800-405-1619. And again, they will give you a 30% discount off the listed price of $22.
Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.